Sevierville, Tennessee. We're just from south of Knoxville. <clears throat> My brother-in-law, Mark Tolson, invited me to go. And to be honest with you, I really wasn't too excited about going. I went only because he was kind of pressuring me to go. It was in Sevierville, about 40 minutes from us. And it was a missions, uh, what was it? I always forget, mission board. It was a mission board putting on a big conference. And so me and Megan went, and uh, they had kind of had you know morning services, afternoon classes, and stuff like that. And so I went to the classes that I thought be, would be the most interesting. There was a class uh, a missionary, Kevin Hall, was teaching about just missions in Africa and different things like that. And so I went. And just for about 30 minutes, Brother Kevin just taught about missions, taught about deputation, and just kind of the African people and how they are with Christianity, different things like that. And just, just in his 30-minute lesson, God really uh, worked on my heart. Even though I was, I was there with a bad attitude, the Lord still pierced through that and affected my heart with his message and his lesson. He made reference in his class, uh, in his lesson, he said, pray for me. He said, I'm going to South Africa next month. This is in January. He said, I'm going to South Africa next month. I got to check up on a few things. I'm going by myself. He was just requesting prayer, so on and so forth. And so as class ended, and as I kind of met these guys, I, I said, Brother, Brother Kevin, I know, I know you don't really know me. I told him who I was. He knew my brother-in-law. I said, I really feel like the Lord wants me to go to South Africa. I really want to go. He said, well, we're taking a big trip in September kind of like you are going. He said, the ch a church group is coming. I said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. If I don't go with you next month, I'm never going to go. I feel like the Lord wants me to go. I really feel like I have to go. He said, okay. He talked to my pastor and kind of, I guess, kind of figured out I wasn't too crazy. He said, Brother Josh, you c you're more than welcome to go. I'd love to have you come, but here's the deal. I'm leaving in 30 days. I can't change my trip. If you want to go, you'll need a passport, of course. You got to have one of those just to get out of the state of Tennessee. And so I needed a passport. Never barely been outside of Tennessee my entire life. So I needed a passport. I needed a, uh, the, you, some of you that are going, you know the, the list. I needed about $2,500. Of course, you got to have a plane ticket if you want to go. All the different things that I needed. And I thought to myself, man, this is a lot in 30 days. You know, I think so, you guys probably been planning for a while now. He said, uh, you're more than welcome to go, but you'll need about $2,500. I think it was the total price. $2,500 for a 19-year-old working at Hobby Lobby uh, is a lot of money. <laughs> I, I, to me, I felt like $25,000 that I needed. But church, I want you to understand that if God puts a burden on your heart, He will meet the need. Amen? Amen. Every single time. Amen. As your pastor already mentioned, praise the Lord. That's exactly what He did for me. I knew that it was His will. He met the need. He raised even more money than I needed. My passport came in right in time, and I left with Brother Kevin, another young man, and spent 16 days in South Africa. With a missionary, I was able to see the churches that he was planted. God had just called me to preach at this time. I was even able to preach in some of these churches. <clears throat> and so God really used that entire trip to really change my life. He changed my life. He changed everything about me, my personality. I tell you what, to be in a church with most of the people there walked there. They, they walked a long way to get there. They, they sang songs just like we sang. Well, maybe not just like we sing. They sway a little bit more. They get a little more beat when they sing, more than you all did this evening. But, um, <clears throat> but I tell you what, just being around these people who, you know, years ago had nothing, never even heard the gospel, now were saved and serving God, it, it, it changed my life. And I may be partial, but those children singing, I, I love to hear Africans sing. To me, I feel like it's what heaven's going to sound like. And so I love it. But church, I want you to understand this evening the reason why my family is here is because most South African people, if Christ was to come back tonight, most African people, especially most South African people, they wouldn't go to heaven because their religion and their culture will not allow it, like the video said. They believe in God. They know Jesus. It's kind of like church in the South. Everybody knows Jesus. Everybody thinks they're going to heaven when they die. But to them, God is the furthest away ancestor. They believe he's unreachable. He's unattainable. There's no way they can communicate to him. They believe they must go through whatever ancestor is most recent to pass away. Maybe a, a grandfather, grandparent, great-grandparent. Sometimes, a, a lot of the times, the uncle is the one who carries a lot of the burden as far as the... And they'll pray to their uncle that has passed away. And they're not even really looking for salvation. They're just looking for good fortune in their life. And if you've ever heard of Africa, you know that good fortune really doesn't ever come to those people. They're trusting in something that will never bring them hope. But church, we know this evening that there's only one mediator between God and man. It's not Papaw, 
but it's the man Christ Jesus who died for the sins of the whole world. He died for everybody. But he's left it up to us to give that message out. Amen. South Africa is a country of about 55, it might be more now, 56 million people. 80% of the population are black South African people, just like you would imagine, just like you would think of any African country. But there's a large population of white people. There's also a large population of what they call colored people. Those are mixed people. Each, each people group has its own place where they live. Each people group has its own language. Each people group uh, has their, their own schools that they go to. There's not much mix in between. They're very separated even to today. There's, there's black schools and white schools. There's black hospitals and white hospitals. That's based, mostly based on because they can't afford to go to the, the, the nicer white hospital. But, you know, South Africa is a first world country and a third world country in the same place. When you're in the city, you, you that go on the trip, when you're staying where you're going to stay, and when you're in the city... You feel like you're just maybe in Florida or something like that because Port Elizabeth's right on the ocean. But when you go just a few miles outside of town, you'll see that you're in a third world country. Dirt roads, shack houses, uh, eight to ten people living in a four-room shack, shack on top of shack on top of shack. Some of those townships have 20, 25, 50,000 people in one tiny area. And most of these people have no independent Baptist churches they can walk to. So God has called me and my family to go to South Africa to preach the gospel, to plant churches, to tell people about Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord, we're excited to do that uh, when we get there. I want you to understand this evening that among black South African people, 25% of them have HIV or AIDS. That's the highest number in the world for a certain people group. It may be even higher than 25 now, but it's somewhere around that percentage. And so many, many, I think there's nearly 4 million orphans in South Africa. Uh, we could talk all night about stats and figures, and, and it, it's just really heartbreaking to experience it and to see it with your own eyes. But the most heartbreaking thing is that a majority of these people will die without ever having one opportunity to hear a clear presentation of the gospel. I was telling the, the brothers and pastors in there that at six years old, I went to a vacation Bible school. Praise the Lord, my, my mom took me, been going to church since I was two. And at six years old, at the young age of six years old, I heard the gospel and understood it. God touched my heart. I realized I was lost, and Christ saved me that day. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God that he saved me at such a young age I was able to be in church. I would say that's the testimony of many people in here. I know some people were not saved till they were older. I understand some people may were not raised in church, but I'd say it's at least over 50% tonight that, were, that were, grew up in church. In places like South Africa and other places in the world, these people will be born, they'll live, and they'll die without having, having one opportunity to even have a church in their own town where they can hear the gospel. So that was, that's what God called us to do, and I'll, I'll finish with this before we preach. We'll be in Acts chapter 3, if you want to go ahead and turn there to Acts chapter 3. I'll go ahead and turn there too. I'm in Leviticus 23. But turn to Acts chapter 3. But one of the biggest things in South Africa that touched my heart is uh, I mentioned 25% of every South African has HIV or AIDS. Understand in America, the life expectancy of any male of any race is 77, 78 years old. It gets, it gets bigger every year that goes by, praise the Lord. Uh, but in South Africa today, the life expectancy of a black male, get this, is 55 years old. And so I turned, I'm 28 years old today, praise the Lord. Today's my birthday. You can make donations just straight to my name if you want to. You can send them to the clearinghouse as well. That's up to you. But I turned 28 years old today. Get this, at 28 years old, at the young age of 28 years old, I still feel young. I'd be a middle-aged man if I was a black South African. Uh, it's really hard to fathom, really hard to think about that, but it's very, very true. And so keep South Africa in your prayers. I can't wait for you all that go on the trip and get to see it for yourself. And so praise the Lord for that. that that's bad news. That's sad news. It's kind of turns your stomach, stuff that you don't want to hear. But there is good news. Amen? There is good news. There is hope in this world. Amen. And it's through Jesus Christ. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 3, and I want to preach to you about this tonight. You know, whether it be your pastor or the missions team this week or, a, or, or me and my family, even anybody in this church tonight, if we're going to do any kind of service for our Lord, we've got to have boldness to do it, right? Amen? 
I told the, the brothers in the, in the little meeting we had that I, I worked on staff at my church. And when I say that I knock doors, that's not just something I say. I, my, I showed up my first day of work. My pastor had my schedule out for me. I was excited about working at the church. They had voted me to hire me on. And he had my schedule, but he also had a, some other stuff with him. He had a map he had printed out. And he had four or five big stacks of tracks. And he said, here's what I want you to do. When you're done teaching your class, I taught in the Christian school. He said, when you're done teaching your last class around 12, I want you to go to this neighborhood and I want you to knock doors until you run out of tracks. And so for at least four, sometimes six days a week for the Fellowship Baptist Church in Maryville, Tennessee, I did some kind of door knocking. Praise the Lord. I'm very thankful for that experience. Praise God. But I can remember when I first went out, you know, me and my wife had a bus route. And so I was, I was experienced and comfortable with somebody, you know, inviting kids to church. And we, we had Tuesday night soul winning and stuff like that. But this is the first time in my life, at 21 years old, out in the middle of the neighborhood at 2 o'clock knocking doors. And I can remember when I first started my first day, my door knocks kind of sounded something like this. Did you hear that? I hope not. <laughs> Sometimes I prayed that they would not hear the door because I was nervous. I was scared. Church, I didn't have the boldness that I needed, right? To be out there knocking doors, inviting people to church, telling them about Christ, telling them about our pastor and stuff like that. Praise the Lord that came and, that, and, and we need to continue to grow in that as we move to South Africa. But even anybody in this service, if you're going to do Christian worship, you've got to have boldness to do it. As we get to Acts chapter 3, we see that Peter and John did not lack in boldness. I, I say that it's their middle names as we move on and read through this story in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4. I'm going to start reading and then we'll pray, but look in verse 1 of chapter 3. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. Even Peter and John went two by two. I was by myself, so cut me some slack. But uh, that's a joke. But Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. I think we all have experienced that. Even me and my wife today, on our way here, at a red light, we experienced a lady that was needing some help, and we gave her some snacks. And so praying, gave her a track, praise the Lord. But I think we've all experienced that. This is what Peter and John's having. And in verse 4, it says, And Peter, fasting his eyes on him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. But then Peter said, this is what he said, he said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Let, let's pray, and then we'll just jump right into the message. Dear Father God, I thank you so much for the service tonight. Lord, I thank you for this church allowing my family to come. God, we're undeserving, but I greatly appreciate the opportunity, Lord. I thank you for what this church is, is going to do for us, God. It's a great, great help. I pray that you'd bless them, help their trip that they're about to have tonight, God. I pray for these people in this service tonight, God, these teens that have come in. I pray that you'd do a work tonight in our hearts. Lord God, I pray that you'd use the message, God, and not, not my words, Lord, but your words, God, to bless, to help, to encourage, and to equip us, God, to be stronger and bolder for you. Help me tonight, God, undergird me, fill me, and use me, Lord, for your honor, your honor God. Help me not to not say anything that I don't need to say tonight, God. Help us to be clear and concise in your words. We love you. We thank you and praise you for what you've done and what you will do in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We just read the story here. When we get to verse 6, I believe Peter is telling this man the truth. I don't have, I don't have anything to give you. Uh, and I think we've, we've all been there. I really don't have anything to give you. But he gives him something very special here. If you look in verse 6. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. The Bible says, immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. We are reading that this man is being physically healed. Praise the Lord for physical healings. But I believe also this is the time that this man is spiritually healed. And I'll show you why. But this man is spiritually healed. The Bible says in verse 7 that it was immediate. Praise the Lord the day that I got saved, even at six years old. Uh, the day that I asked him to save me, he saved me. It was immediate. It wasn't a process that I had to go through, praise God. He sa and immediately, look in verse 8. It says, And he leaped up, talking about this lame man, and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising who? God. The slain man knew. I don't see, I mean, I may be wrong, but I don't see a big gap between 7 and 8. 
This lame man knew that it was not Peter or John that healed him, but that it was God that made the difference in his life. Amen? It's God that made the difference in my life, and I'm sure made the difference in your life. Church tonight, first of all, if we as individual Christians are going to speak the Word of God with boldness, we must rely on God. We must rely on the one that we possess. Amen? Praise the Lord that Jesus Christ, when He saved us, He gave us that comforter. We talked about, Pastor already spoke a little bit about the day of Pentecost. When he sent the comforter on those men, and now that when the day that we get saved, praise the Lord, we don't have to earn it, he gives us that comforter, that spirit. Praise the Lord, we're to feed that spirit, we're to walk in that spirit, we're not to grieve that spirit, praise the Lord. It's going to be that spirit that encourages and equips us and helps us as we serve God. You know, I can't depend on my own abilities if I'm going to move all the way to South Africa and plant churches, we, we will be unsuccessful, I'll tell you that right now. You know, I, I can't depend on trying to please the Fellowship Baptist Church here or the Fellowship Baptist Church in my hometown. You know, if we go to South Africa to, just to please them, we're not going to get much done. But if we go depending on the Spirit of God and in Jesus Christ's leadership, we might be successful. Amen? Praise the Lord. We must rely on the one that we possess, that Spirit of God, that Comforter. Praise the Lord. The slain man knew, as we already mentioned, that it was God that changed his life. Look in verse 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which set for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Verse 11 says, And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch is called Solomon's greatly wondering, as we would be if we saw something like this, greatly wondering. Peter is very tactful here in verse 12, and he it says, and when he saw it, he answered to the people this. This is what he says. Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look you so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? Church, not only did the lame man know that it was God that changed his life, but the servants here, Peter and John, they knew they had no ability within themselves, but that it was Jesus Christ that made all the difference in their life and in their ministry. Praise the Lord. We're to have that same attitude. If we are going to do anything for God, we must rely on Him. Verse, we won't read it, but from, from verse 13 all the way down to the end of chapter 3, Peter gets all their attention. The miracle's been done. Everybody's wondering what's going on. And he preaches to these people, Jesus Christ. He preaches the gospel to them. Praise the Lord. When we get to chapter 4 and in verse 1, it says, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold into the next day for it was now eventide. We don't worry about that here in Virginia nor in Tennessee. Praise the Lord, even in South Africa, as for now, this is not something we worry about. My brother-in-law, Mark Tolson, worries about this every single Sunday in China. But praise the Lord, we don't have to here. But Peter and John, I think maybe they knew this would happen. But the priests and these other powerful men here in the temple are very upset with somebody preaching about somebody that they killed, right? Preaching about Jesus. They take him in verse 3. They put him in some kind of holding cell overnight. Verse 4 comes around and says, how be it? Many of them which heard the word, what? Believed. And the number of the men, just the men, counting all the heads of the men, was about somewhere around 5,000 men saved. In one evening, because of the boldness of Peter and John, praise the Lord, because they were depending on the Spirit of God to get a work done, God made a work, praise the Lord. Not even counting the women or children that may have gotten saved that day, praise God. Verse 5 says, And it came to pass on the morrow, they've been in holding all night, and then the rulers and the elders and the scribes and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas and John, I feel like we're just naming names here, and Alexander, and as many were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. They called in the big dogs, I call them. They called in the big dogs because they're worried about what's happening here. And they want to try to stop it. Uh, I'm in the south, right? They want to try to nip it in the bud before it moves on, right? I think we all understand that. Verse 7 says, And when they had set them in the midst, that here's the question they asked them. By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he has made whole, be it known unto you all, 
and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified and whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you all. Long, and to make a short story out of a long one, they said, what power did you use to do this great thing? And Peter says it's only by the power of Jesus Christ. First of all, church, if we're going to speak the word of God with boldness, we must rely on the one that we possess, that spirit of God. Second of all, church, we must realize the power that we have as Christians. We're not powerless in this day and age, even though it may seem like it with the culture that we have here in America. We are not powerless, praise the Lord. Jesus Christ gave us the most powerful thing on this entire world, this Bible right here. I see some photos back there of some men that preached this Bible and were killed trying to preserve this Bible, praise the Lord. Nothing ever happened to it, and we have it and even to this day. There's power in these scriptures. There's power in the Spirit of God that we already talked about. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. That name means a little bit more than the name Muhammad or, or, or the name Allah or the name Buddha, right? That word Jesus, it has a lot of power to it. If somebody says they believe in Buddha, nobody really bats an eye at them, right? They kind of say, okay, whatever. But when you say you follow Jesus Christ, uh, that means something a lot different, praise the Lord. We must realize the power that we have as Christians. Let me tell you a story, a little bit about the power that we have. I was in a missions conference in South Carolina last year, and I met a missionary there, church planner in Philadelphia. Okay, He was on furlough, trying to raise some extra money to plant his second church in Philadelphia. He told his testimony. He said when he was in his mid to late 20s, he moved to this new city in Arkansas. The first week that he was there, he got a knock on his door went outside and there was a young man, teenage boy, handed him a track and invited him to the church down the road. He said, thank you. He said, well, I wasn't mean to him, but he said, I had no interest in going to church, but I just took it, said thank you, and went on. He said the next Thursday night rolled around. He was kind of getting settled into the new town. He was unmarried, didn't have a family yet. Knock came again. He went outside and it was the same teenage boy with the same track inviting him to church. He said, oh, you got me last week, brother. He said, I know I did, but I just want to invite you again. I want, I want you to come. So the next week rolled around, the same thing, Thursday night, between 6 and 7, another knock on the door, same thing the next week. He said, this went on for about 7, 8, 10 weeks in a row. This boy came to my, hearse, my house. He said, it happened so many times that I knew not to be home between 6 and 7 on Thursday night because I was going to have to talk to this boy again. He said, one Thursday night rolled around, and as the week went on, I just forgot it was Thursday. About the 10th, 11th time, this boy comes, knocks on my door, hands me a track again. By this time, we're friends. He, he knows everything about me. He said, I couldn't tell him no one more time. He said he went to church. And what do you think happens when lost people come to the house of God where they preach the gospel? Amen. He got saved. Praise the Lord. He got saved. Amen. Here's what I take from that. Just an amazing story, but here's what I take from that. What if that boy, that teenage boy, had only gone six times? What if he'd only gone three times? To me, two times is a lot, right? To me, two times is a lot of times to go to the same door. If this boy had only limited himself six or seven times to witness to this man, there would be two less churches and one less missionary in this world today. That's a fact. Amen. But because this boy, allowing God to lead him to this man, praise the Lord, God made a difference in this world. Me and you have that same ability and that same power through Jesus Christ. Maybe it's one more invitation to get that lost coworker to come. Amen. Maybe it's one more time talking to your neighbor. That maybe they're just waiting for you to ask him one more time if they're saved so they can get it explained to them one more time so they can get saved. Don't have the attitude in their mind that they're annoyed. They don't want to hear this. They don't like me. No, 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 no. Keep on for the Lord. Keep telling people about Jesus. Praise the Lord. His word does not come back void. Let's move on down to verse... We already talked about the, the, being possessed with God. We talked about the power. Move on down to verse 13 as we finish into our last point. Verse 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness, here's our boldness. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And you know, maybe, I don't know about northern Virginia, but especially in East Tennessee, we have a perception, right, of being unlearned and ignorant. I feel for, for, for uh, Peter and John, right? I met a woman from Ohio one time. We were in New York State, I think. And she said, I grew up in Ohio. And she said, I always thought people from Kentucky were just 
you know, hillbillies. And I thought people from Tennessee were the ones that didn't wear shoes and didn't have any teeth. <laughs> and I said, well, I know plenty of people like that. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm from the foothills of East Tennessee. And so I get that. But she had a perception, right, that, yet, that Southern people were just unlearned and ignorant. Here's what they say. The reason why there's so many churches in the South is because those people are too ignorant and they don't know any better to know that there is no God, right? Church, it's not that we, it's not that we don't know any better. It, it's that we have found none better. Amen? Can I get a witness? Praise the Lord. I found nothing better than Jesus Christ. That's exactly where Peter and John are. They see their boldness. They, they, they see him as unlearned and ignorant and they marvel. Look at the second part of that verse. I've got to turn my page. They marveled and they also took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You know, they had every perception of them that they wanted, but it was undeniable that these were men of God. They acted like that Christ that they met before. They, they, they talked like him. They said the same things he did, right? That everything that they did was just like Jesus. These were men of God. Church, can, can, can your neighbor, your co-worker, your family... Your wife, your children, can they look at you and can they take knowledge that you have a relationship with God? Amen. Even as a missionary, does my wife look at me and can she tell that I have a relationship with God? She, she better, amen. She ought to. Otherwise, I'm not doing my job. We're not doing our job as Christians. Praise the Lord. It was all over Peter and John. It was undeniable. Verse 14 says, And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But... When they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. We're pretty close to a city in America where there's a lot of lost people conferring among themselves. Am I right? Up here in Washington, D.C. We see how good that has done. So put yourself in Peter and John's shoes. These men are going to confer among themselves about what they're going to do to Peter and John. Verse 16 says, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed an old miracle hath been done by them, and it is manifest to all that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Praise the Lord, if you do a work for Jesus Christ, it will be undeniable. Verse 17 says, But that it spread no further among the people, let us surely threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Now I don't know about you, but I've been threatened a few times, but, but a lot of times those were in grade school, right? And just silly little threats that didn't really have a lot of backing to them. I've never really been threatened by somebody with authority. Maybe you have. I don't know. But here, this is, a, this is a real threat. This is not just a slap on the wrist. Understand that Peter and John, as they go into this, to this meeting room to meet with these men that are about to threaten them, understand that they've already killed Christ. Of course, we know that he allowed himself to die for our sins. We understand that. But they've already have some actions here that prove that they're not joking. Eventually, they will kill Peter. Eventually, they will put John on the island with prisoners. Eventually, they will kill every single other apostle. Eventually, they'll take John, or James, I'm sorry, Christ's brother, and throw him off the tallest building in the city to watch him die. Eventually, they'll take Christians in the book of Acts. The Bible says they took animal skins and stitch it into their back threw them out into the desert till they bake from the inside out. That's the men that they're standing in front of. When we get to this question, I want you to keep that in your mind. Verse 18 says, And they called the men, and they commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, this is their answer, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. What they're saying is you have to make a decision on where you stand with God. Verse 20 says, but as for us, we've made our decision. Praise the Lord. They said, for we cannot but speak the things which you have seen and heard. Amen. Church, we said we must rely on the one that we possess. Very important. We must realize the power that we have as Christians. We're not here powerless. Praise God. Thirdly, and I'd say most importantly, if we're going to speak the word of God with boldness, we must realize whom it is that we are to please. Amen. We're not here to please men. We're here to please Him. Praise the Lord. We're not even here to please ourselves. My wife was not created for Josh Sullivan to please Josh Sullivan. She was created in the image of God to serve Christ and to bring Him honor and glory with His life. Amen. Same with my children. Praise the Lord. Same with everyone in here. You were created to bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ and to serve Him. Praise the Lord. 
we must realize that remem- and remember that we are here to please him. You know, as Southern people, I don't think we really struggle with that first part, trying to please other people. Amen. They said when, in Obama's eight years of presidency, more ammo was sold in those eight years than like the 15 years before that. Right? People don't like being told what to do. But where I struggle and probably where you struggle is that second part, doing what I want to do. Doing what Josh wants to do a lot of times gets in front of what, what God wants to do. God wants me to do. Amen. We struggle with doing our own thing and serving ourselves instead of serving Jesus Christ. You know, there's some commandments given in our Bible, and I'm finished, and I'll finish with this. There's commandments throughout our Bible. We already talked about some of the commandments of the feasts that they were supposed to do. Those weren't suggestions, were they? Those feasts. No, those were commandments that God wanted the Jewish people to do. We learned about the Ten Commandments as children, right? We're to follow those, but understand we're not to follow those for salvation, but we follow those to realize that we can't follow them all, right? We can't do all of these things. That's why the, the lamb that they sacrificed every year would only last a year, right? Sometimes, depending on what sins they did, they had to do extra sacrifices. Praise the Lord our God sent us his own sacrifice, spotless and perfect, in Jesus Christ that would be sacrificed for me and you, not just for a year, praise God, and not just for the Jew, praise God, but for every man for eternity. That's who we put our faith and trust in. But those commandments were given to us not, not to be saved, but to please God. To bring Him honor and glory with our life. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Amen? That's my wife. She has that stenciled on, on, above our bedspread. Amen? She, that's her favorite verse in the Bible. Right? I'm, that's a joke. <laughs> Uh, uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. These are not suggestions, but these are given to us to bring glory and honor to our God. Church, there is a commandment given to all of us that we find throughout our New Testament. Mark 16, 15, Matthew 28, 19. Christ's last words on this earth before he ascended up to heaven in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And it was all this, to go. Go. Go ye therefore and preach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Like the other commandments, it's not a suggestion. And like the other commandments, it's not just for the pastor. And it's not just for the missionary. Praise the Lord, you've got flags from all over the world. Praise God. I think a brother told me you support around 50 missionaries. Praise the Lord. I'm sure if y'all had even more means, you would take on more as the years go by. It may be, I don't know, but it may be a goal of your pastor to support a missionary in every country. That would be great, praise God. But church, tonight we could take on a missionary to every single country in this world and we could still fail miserably at getting the gospel to the world. The only way that's going to be possible is if me, and pastor, and church member, and deacon, and every individual Christian takes that responsibility upon himself or herself. That's how we're going to turn the world upside down just like they did in the book of Acts. Church, let's pray. Pastor, you come. I'm just going to pray and allow the pastor to finish the service however he'd like. But dear God, we are so thankful for salvation. Praise the Lord God you saved me. I'm sure that's the testimony of many people in here. God, you saved us. Lord, we praise your name for that, God. But God, I pray you help us to understand this evening that you didn't just save us and leave us to our own devices. God, we're to work for you. Or to tell others about you, God, or to live a life that would be pleasing to you, Lord. I pray you challenge us to do that, God. Even me, even me as a missionary, God, I need to do more for you with my life. God, I pray you'd help us to understand that, apply that to our life, Lord God. I thank you for this example of these men. And I pray you should use these examples, God, to encourage and equip us, God, to do a great and mighty work for you. Lord, I, I, don't, know, I don't know any of these people, God. There may be one tonight that's lost. I pray that you'd prick their heart, God. Help them to see their lost state. God, there may be one like I was in the past that's maybe a little backslidden. Help us to be reclaimed in you, God, and to live our life pleasing to you. Make that decision tonight. Lord, we love you and thank you and praise you for all that you have done and all that you will do. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.